before Netflix sort of took over everything, um, there was a show on television called 24 with Jack Bauer. Did anyone watch it? Yes, yes. Um, if you didn't watch it, the premise of the show was it was supposed to be one minute of television me related to one real minute in, in our world. And so yeah, there was 24 episodes, an hour long, and it was basically how much action could you pack in one day. And it was over the top ridiculous, you know, the amount of stuff that would happen. You sort of go, that can't possibly happen in one day. Well, that's the premise of the sermon series we're looking at, because in a sense, we're going to be looking at a 24-hour period in the life of Jesus where they did pack so much into one day that it's almost, um, you know, you feel like, oh, this has to be over-the-top writing. But it actually happened that way. So um, last week we looked at the prologue. Um, so if, if, if you were good, you would have picked up that I used the same logo from the 24 in the logo that I've been using for this series. But we looked at the prologue last week, chapter 3, the, the little bit leading up to this 24-hour period. Uh, and we, we saw that even then it was fairly pressure-filled. You know, Jesus was being pressured by the crowds, um, that he was being hit with family expectations, criticised by the, the religious leaders. He was, Jesus himself was stirring the pot and it's actually got to one point where he was saying he was so busy he did not have time to eat and his family's going, you're crazy, you've got you to slow down a bit, you're crazy doing this amount. And this was even before the 24-hour period happened. This was in the lead-up to it. And so Jesus um, enters into this 24-hour period already run down, already exhausted, and then this happens. So what happens in the 24 hours? Well, I put together this great graphic to try and explain it, but we're going to unpack this as we move through. But there is so much that happens in this 24-hour period in Mark chapters 4 and 5, um, which I've sort of split up into Jesus does some teaching, both to the crowd and then um, to his disciples. Then uh, we move into the nighttime area where he's crossing over to the other side of Lake Galilee and he calms the storm. On the other side of the lake in the early morning, he meets uh, um, a man and ends up having flying pigs. Um, we'll get to that story later as well. They jump back in their boat. They go back to the other side when Jesus gets hit with more expectations, more healings, um, raising the dead and a miracle on the way to raise somebody from the dead. All of that happens in a 24-hour period. It is full on. And as I said, we're going to um, unpack some of those over the next couple of weeks, um, some of these stories of not only what happened, but how was Jesus responding to all of these things as we go through. But before I get to that, I just want to go out on a little aside and talk about the harmony of the Gospels, the harmony of the Gospels. We all know that there's four Gospels, four um, you know, writings of the life of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And I assume that you've noticed when you've read your Bible that Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are not the same. Um, they've, even though they're all eyewitnesses of the story of Jesus' life and ministry, the stories that they write down in their Gospel are not identical. They are not identical. And some of that can be just simply, you know, well, there's four different witnesses watching the same thing. They're never going to write the exact same thing. But there is a study of how close these things match up, and it's called the harmony of the Gospels. How, how well does one Gospel match up with the others? Does it make sense? And when we talk about the harmony of the Gospels, um, we might have four Gospels, but one is not like the other. And so you've got John down the bottom there, which is quite different to the other three. So when we look at the first three, we actually call them the synoptic Gospels because they synchronise quite well. So the stories in Matthew and Mark and Luke sort of match up-ish. You know, they're not perfectly matching up, but you can start to see the patterns in the three of them across. Whereas John is completely different because John took a different approach to writing his Gospel. 
whereas the others are writing a chronological story, almost like a, a newspaper reporting of what happened. John decides, that, rather, I'm not going to give you a chronological version, I'm going to give you a, a narrative where I reveal to you that Jesus is the Messiah. He actually says it at the beginning and at the end of his Gospels. This is what I've done. And so there's no, you know, he sometimes changes things around to better suit his narrative of the revelation of who Jesus is. And a classic example of that is the cleansing of the temple. In Matthew, Mark and Luke, uh, Jesus, you know, t overturns the tables in the temple um, at the beginning of Holy Week. In John, it's in John chapter 2. And you might go, well... Did Jesus overturn the tables twice? <laughs> you know, once at the beginning of his ministry and once at the end of his ministry? Maybe. We don't really know. But a more likely answer is that John doesn't care about chronological order. And that story better fitted his narrative at the beginning. So John's not, you know, making it up. He's, he's just, he doesn't have an interest in putting it in a chronological order rather the revelation. So is, is that all sort of making sense? Why have I gone off on this aside? Well, if you come back to this 24-hour period, in the Synoptic Gospels, all of them have this crazy 24-hour period. It is not just Mark who puts it in a 24-hour period. They all put it in a 24-hour period, which sort of implies that this actually did happen this way, that Jesus did actually have 24 hours of non-stop action. Now, once again, being that they all vary a little bit, you can start to see that some of them have other things and not, um, they don't all match up all the way through. Like Matthew has the healing of the paralysed man in the morning where he got lowered down through the ceiling, uh, where um, Mark and Luke don't have that. <laughs> so you can sort of see a few different variations, but largely it happens the same way right across. So... Let's come back to the 24 hours and let's start working through it. What happens in this 24 hours? Well, to begin with, it doesn't actually seem that spectacular. It's just got Jesus teaching on the side of the lake. Uh, but I think we need to be careful not to undersell this teaching because it's one of the, the few examples of Jesus teaching to a large crowd um, and extended for an extended period. So verse 1 tells us that Jesus began to teach by the lake and a crowd gathered that was so large that he got into the boat and had to go out a bit. So he actually had a bit more room to project to the large crowd on the, on the shore, on the water's edge. So as I said, Jesus did a lot of teaching during his earthly ministry, but there's not that many examples of Jesus doing an extended period of teaching to a large crowd. And this is one of them. In Matthew's version um, of, of this 24-hour period, it's not actually, he doesn't have Jesus teaching on the side of a lake. He has Jesus teaching on the side of a mountain. Yes, in the Matthew version, the teaching that happens at this 24-hour period is the Sermon on the Mount. You know, what we would say was Jesus' greatest time of teaching happened at the beginning of this 24-hour period. Now, put that in context. Remember what we did last week? Jesus is already exhausted and run down. A lot of pressure from crowds and family and, and religious leaders. And then he suddenly goes into a, an extended period of significant teaching. It's quite extraordinary, isn't it? You know, in the Matthew version, he's already exhausted and he does the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> in here, he does, um, in, the, in the Mark version that we had read out, you know, some of the great parables are all coming out in this moment of him being exhausted and, and already run down. I'm going to come back to the way that Jesus is, is responding to what is happening here in a moment, but I thought it was actually... Uh, um, good to focus on the teaching itself, to actually spend a little bit of time looking at the teaching itself. And the first thing in our reading today was the parable of the sower. Part of the trap that we fall in with church, especially those of us who've been in church all our lives, is that when we get to these classic forms of teaching, we tune out, don't we? 
We learned the parable of the sower in Sunday school or in youth groups. We, <laughs> when's the last time you've heard a full sermon on the parable of the sower? I don't think I've preached one in 15 years. Why? Because I assume that you all know what the parable of the sower is about. It's this assumption that oh, we've heard it so many times, we don't need to focus on this, do we? I don't, yeah, I don't think I've ever done it. And even today, when I, when I was looking at these readings, I went, no, let's not talk about the parable of the sower, let's talk about how Jesus coped with this. <laughs> you know, I've sort of skimmed over it even in my prep work for this. And I think that can be a bit of a trap. Because this teaching is classic teaching for a reason. Even though we have heard this parable numerous times, I actually do believe that parables have the power to speak to us in new and fresh ways in different periods in our life. And if we just go, oh, we already know the answer to this and skim over it, then we miss those opportunities for these parables to continue to speak. You know, in our Bible reading, Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm speaking in parables for a reason. Those of you who have ears to hear, then listen. Then listen. So I've have a, I have an experiment. This reading has got four different parables. Um, that's the reason I, you got one of these. If you don't have one of the sheets of paper on the way in, um, I'm sure that somebody at the back can grab you one and, and hand you one. Um, I've got an experiment for today. I'm just going to ask you for the next three minutes not necessarily to talk to the person next to you. So those people who don't like doing that, this one's for you today. Um, I'm actually just going to ask you to sit there and to reflect and allow these passages to speak to you in your situation today. So uh, I don't care which one you focus on. You can focus on all four, but you probably won't have time. But let's just see, uh, we'll, we'll ask the question, what is God saying to us today? What is God saying to us today in either of these four with any of these four parables? If you're a person like me and just can't sit still for three minutes, um, find the person who's fidgeting next to you and talk to them. Um, but but otherwise, let's just let's just read the things and see what God says. I'm not going to ask you at the end to share with all of us publicly. So if you're watching this at home, you can pull out your phone. Um, and just skim through those readings. Let's just give ourselves three or four minutes just to see what God might speak to us through these passages. You right with this? I'll come back in a moment. Give you 60 more seconds. If you want to speak to the people around you, you can.
All right, how did that go? It's hard to have a couple of minutes of silence in the middle of church, isn't it? We're not used to this. We are not used to this. I said that last week. This idea of just stopping and reflecting is not something we normally would naturally do in church. Maybe for some of us, not even in our own lives. But did God say anything to you? I'm not asking you to respond back. I'm just asking the question, did, did God say anything to you? Did something jump out of those readings? You go, oh, that's new. Or oh, that's not something I'd thought about before. That's the power of the parables to continue to speak to us in different ways, um, in different times in our lives. And I think we need to keep coming back to the parables and allowing ourselves to op- uh, for God to speak to us through them. What I'd like to do for the next few minutes is to give you my answer of what I experienced when I was reflecting on this, writing my sermon. And so I had a few different ideas come out, particularly in terms of what we've been reflecting, well, I've been reflecting on this work-family-life balance. Um, And I just wanted to share some of the the insights I had. Um, Maybe they might be helpful to you or maybe they won't, but we'll we'll see how we go. So in terms of the imagery of the the sower and the seeds, uh, the imagery of the thorns really jumped out to me, this idea of of life being so full of stuff, um, that my life is being crowded out by stuff, by the expectations of work and family and, and everything, that there's not much space for me to grow. That just really spoke to me in, in the, where I am right now. How do I find space to grow if there's already so much that's happening around me? I wondered where the stony soil fitted in and that idea that the stony soil didn't allow much depth, and that also convicted me a little bit too. Um, maybe in that sense of what we were talking about last week, if we're running on empty, there's not much depth there. There's not much for the roots to go down into if we're already running on empty. How do we continue to have depth in our life that helps in that spiritual growth, if the roots can't go down because we don't have much left in the tank. Or even worse, if we've got so used to running non-stop, are we a bit like the path, that the opportunities for spiritual growth or the opportunities for that reflection and, and that sense of connecting with God, they're just bouncing off me because I'm so used to running at 100 miles an hour that they're not even getting a chance to take root If we want to be spiritually growing, how do we tend to our lives, to the soil within us, to create a good environment which gives space for that growth? I also reflected a little bit on the parable of the lamp. Um, And and the more I thought about it, you know, it's, it's, for me, it was less about, you know, trying to make sure that I lit up the whole space, but by going, well, if I'm producing this life, where can I put that light that's going to be the most effective, to light up the most? If I can't do everything, where am I going to put it that's going to be the most effective? And for me, I was reflecting on, you know, in terms of my own energy, my passion, my time, my focus, do I have to ask the same questions? If I can't do everything then where do I invest my time and my energy to make the most difference? I also was encouraged that in this parable, producing the light didn't seem to be the problem. There was no problem producing light. (laughs) The question was, what do you do with the light once you produce it? And so this idea that, oh, no, we, we, we can't make the difference the Bible is sort of implying, no, we can. <laughs> we all can be doing this. We all can produce light. That's not the problem. The question is, where do we place that light? And we get to make that decision. And we need to be wise in working out that placement. And just when we start to feel a bit overwhelmed by those two parables going, 
well, we have to work out how do we create space for our seed to grow and where we're going to be wise and put our light. I love how the next two parables, the parables of the seeds, sort of turn the focus away from us and back to God. And that's what I got out of the last two seeds. You know, that, that simple one by basically saying, you know, yes, we can influence the rate of growth of our seed. You know, we need to put it in good soil. But we don't grow the seed. <laughs> you know, the parable of the, the first parable, the third parable there was clear. It is God who produces the growth. And even the parable of the mustard seed, we might go, oh, we don't have much to offer here. Well, that's okay. It is God who does the work, not us. We just have to be wise um, and make that space or wise in working out where we put our light. I don't know. I don't know if any of that was helpful to you. But as I was going through that process, I was reminding myself of the the power of the parables. That yes, they still can speak to me, even though I've known these parables for 40 odd years. But they still did, still, still speak to me when I slowed down enough and went, all right, what is he saying to me right now? Right now. So to finish with, I just want to circle right back and refocus back on Jesus' situation. Because that's what we're looking at, the 24 stuff. Um, and, and remind ourselves that yes, Jesus was surrounded by demanding crowds, clashing with his family and the religious leaders, working so hard that he couldn't find time to eat. And then this 24 hours starts. And he finds his opportunity to engage a large crowd in an extended teaching session. The intriguing thing I find here is that Jesus takes up that opportunity. He could have easily gone, no. Nah. <laughs> I'm gone. I'm already exhausted. I can't teach to a large crowd for the next eight hours. I can't do that. But Jesus didn't do that. He jumped into this opportunity and seemed to cope fine. And yes, we might go, all right, well, that's Jesus. You know, Jesus is divinely, um, you know, got divine strength. Jesus can just keep going. But I think there's something else here. I've Think that when we're asked to do something that we love or that we're passionate about, it's easier to do something like that when we're tired or exhausted. Would you agree? If you're already feeling a bit run down and somebody comes to you and says, can you do this? And it's something you enjoy doing. It's much easier to say yes than if they come and said, oh, can you do this? And it's something you don't like doing. There's something about our passions or our interests that does give us a second wind, energises us even when we feel like there's nothing left in the tank. And I actually think that this is a little bit of where Jesus was coming from, that Jesus actually loved to teach. And when this opportunity came up, it was a bit like going, well, I'm not letting this opportunity go. I'm going to do this even though I'm already run down, even though I'm already tired. And as I said, I'm still amazed that in the Matthew version of this, out of this comes the Sermon of the Mount. You know, could you imagine what we would have missed out on if Jesus went, no, too tired, I'm walking away. It's it's extraordinary that this amazing creative, even the, the Mark stuff that we read out, you know, it was still creative and innovative teaching using parables came out of a period of tiredness and exhaustion. But I actually think it's more than just that Jesus loved to teach. I think for Jesus, it was not only doing something that you love. I think he was energised because he was doing it for the people that he loved. There was that element of going, well, I love the people before me. And I'm going to keep going because these are the people that I love. And a good example of that is when evening came and Jesus got alone with his disciples. What did his disciples do? We didn't understand anything you said. Could you go over it again? (laughs) And remember, Jesus had already had a busy morning. He's now taught all afternoon and almost to the evening. He finally gets some time away from the crowds with his disciples. And his disciples goes, can you just explain to us that again? And what does Jesus do? He could have easily gone, oh, tomorrow, just let me rest. I will explain it all tomorrow. But he doesn't. 
he continues to teach and explains the parables to his disciples and goes over the teaching again. Why? Because these are the people he loves. And you do go the extra mile for the people that you love. As we'll see next week, Jesus does get to a point where he does need rest and does eventually crash and go, no, I'm, I'm done for the day. We'll get to that next week. But for the moment, that sense of not only doing something that he loves, but doing it for the people that he loves was driving his, him forward. And maybe that's the message of hope that we can get out of this for today. Because we too are the people that Jesus loves. And that Jesus just keeps going for the people he loves. And that Jesus will keep going for us too. That sense that Jesus is not going to clock out for us. Jesus will keep going because he keeps going for the people he loves. I'm going to pause there because it's just about to flow onto the next part of the 24 hours. I'm going to call the band to come up again. Um, but we're going to see next week that this 24 hours takes a twist. It's just about to take a twist. Um, we'll get to that next week. Mm-hmm.